friends, I'm truly delighted and honored to be with all of you on the occasion of the 35th Foundation Day. It's rare that an institution grows to such level of excellence in our country because we are in the midst of a culture of mediocrity. It's a source of tremendous joy and pride that not only has LVP grown, but is spreading its wings. Not only is it working at the apex level, but is focused on the primary care, reaching out to 150 million people, directly serving 32 million people, Surgery is almost 2 million. All this with extraordinary qualities manifest at every level. Knowledge, skills, compassion, commitment, integrity, competence, above all, vision. Not only the physical vision, but the larger vision, the imagination and the vision to translate what you perceive as possible into reality. I salute all of you, and in particular, the founder, Dr. J.N. Rao, who showed an exceptional example to all of us, what is possible. He, his family, his team, and all of you deserve not only our congratulations and compliments, but we all owe you a debt of gratitude. We should be particularly grateful to Dr. Rao for accomplishing something almost impossible in India. Many institutions, they suffer from what is called the founder's scourge. It's very difficult to replace a founder. It's very hard to institutionalize a proper functioning succession mechanism. In any society, there's a problem, particularly in India. He has achieved that miracle, not by compulsion, but by choice, not by accident, but by design. It's wonderful that a number of teams across the country and the world are now taking over from Dr. Rao with great success and confidence. And therefore, not only do we rejoice the extraordinary accomplishments of the past, but we also look forward to great a future for these organizations, because these teams are now capable of sustaining it. Thank you once again, Dr. Rao. I was reflecting this morning, what is it I'm going to say to a very distinguished group of men and women of knowledge, skill, and accomplishment. The usual things about what needs to be done, the problems of healthcare, et cetera, I don't think we need to talk at this level. On a few occasions, Dr. Rao and I reflected on what are the possibilities in this country or in the world today? And what is the reality? And can we bridge the gulf? I thought I would share a few reflections on this important theme because Dr. Rao and I, we're more or less of a generation that, is, that has seen more of the past than has a future, that hopes to transfer whatever we have for the next generation to make the big things happen, to make our dreams a reality. I think it's time now we reflected on where we are as a country and in some respects as mankind. I'm a great optimist, but not a romantic optimist, not an irrational exuberant optimist disregarding the realities, but a true optimist. What somebody called possibilists, the people who see immense possibilities and through rational, concerted effort, they recognize that big things can be accomplished. I belong to that category, I'm sure as Dr. Rao does. From that perspective, it occurs to me that today we are in a condition that 
the great writer Charles Dickens. In one of the most memorable opening passages of any fictional work, he said, in the opening passage of, the, of that immortal work, The Tale of Two Cities, it was the best of times. It was the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom. It was the age of foolishness. It was the epoch of belief. It was the epoch of incredulity. It was the season of light. It was the season of darkness. It was the spring of hope. It was the winter of despair. I suppose every generation has these dilemmas. But it occurs to me that today, we're at the cusp. Much of what Dickens wrote reflects our dilemmas today. There are immense possibilities. There are also increasing fears. That's the context in which I'm making these remarks. Hans Rosling, a very distinguished Swedish physician, he argued very ably, he passed away some years ago, that we often underestimate how much we accomplished in the past 50 years, 60 years. In fact, he kept arguing that Sweden, when he was born in 1948, was where Egypt today is, or Egypt was about 10, 20 years ago, because he made these comments about 10, 20 years ago. In one person's lifetime, in Egypt could become a Sweden. We view things as still pictures captured by a camera. We forget that in reality, history is a motion picture. Unless you have a long-term perspective, you don't really see what is happening, the dynamic change. If you view it from a broader historic perspective, we are right now oscillating between a romantic optimism and despair and cynicism. But I truly believe, as Rosling said, we should be possibilists. Because the kind of things that we have accomplished in the past 30 or 40 or 50 years, for all humankind and for us even in a country like India, are extraordinary. You are an embodiment of that. LV Prasad Institute is a symbol of excellence, an embodiment of the possibilities that are translated into reality. And these can be replicated on a wide scale across the country. Take, for instance, your pyramid. If you take a back of the envelope calculation for the vision centers, for the service centers, the tertiary care centers, and the centers of excellence across the country, my rough calculation indicates it probably it costs about a billion dollars in rupees for the whole country, one-time capital investment. Probably an equal amount is going to be spent on actually running the services. Very rough calculations. Today, I care the total expenditure in the country is of the order of about $2 billion, a, a little more or less. Now, for a country of India's size to serve a population of 1.4 billion, to find a billion dollars is child's play. Either one-time capital investment or the expenditure required to provide reasonable quality eye care. Because the benefits are enormous. If roughly about 2% of the people above 50 years of age are blind, if about 11 to 12% of the people above 50 years of age are significantly visually impaired, if the annual loss to the economy on account of vision defects alone is at the order of about a trillion rupees, 100,000 crores, it makes abundant economic sense and common sense that we should spend a billion dollars, about seven or 8,000 crores a year to minimize this problem and to maximize not only the quality of human life, but our growth potential. It's a no-brainer. If you take healthcare 
across the country, the much larger system of which eye care is a very important subset. All we require to provide a reasonable quality health care in the country without burden on the people, without out-of-pocket expenditure for the poor in the country, our middle classes in the country. All it requires is roughly about a trillion rupees per year additional expenditure. We are spending now 1.1% of GDP on healthcare in the country from the public system. That's about 25% or so of the total expenditure in the country. If you just spend another 0.5%, a little under 0.5%, but wisely, in a sensible manner, with the available technology and resources, we can radically transform healthcare outcomes. Today, we are at about 37,000 or 38,000 lost years on account of disability and sickness in the country per 100,000 population. Let me repeat, per 100,000 population, we are losing in terms of quality of life and productivity or lost life, 38,000 years per year, per 100,000 population. Some of it is unavoidable, old age and some disabilities that can be really prevented or cured. If we do a decent job, we can bring it down to about 17 or 18,000 daily years lost. That means about 20,000 years per 100,000 population can be saved by merely spending 0.5% of GDP per year of which health eye care will probably cost about seven or eight percent. This is a ridiculously low cost. We are a remarkably lucky society. Very few societies in the world can claim that by spending just about 0.5% GDP, just about a trillion rupees extra, but in a sensible manner, you can Eliminate poverty on account of ill health. Annually, 55 million people, five and a half floor people, annually, they are descending into poverty on account of ill health, either because of healthcare costs or because of lost income because of morbidity. 55 million people. Now, 55 million people, if you see a country, that would be somewhere about 15th or 17th largest country in the world. That's the number of people who are descending into poverty in this country because we are not availing the existing technology and available resources in a prudent manner to enhance the quality of life. That's the gift of modernity. The reason why Rosling or somebody else would be extremely optimistic is this is eminently possible. All you require are knowledge, skills, competence, compassion, and vision. You don't require some extraordinary new technology. You don't require resources that are not available or affordable. You don't require human skills which are not existent. You just have to harness what is available in an optimal manner. The optimism springs from, springs from the fact that it is possible, the anger and on occasion frustration springs from the fact that despite it being so eminently reachable, sometimes we feel we somehow are determined not to avail these advantages. We want to wallow in cynicism and despair and self-pity instead of acting on what is available. I am a great optimist, simply because human societies have the capacity to learn from past mistakes, to look at the immense possibilities of the future, to relate them to their own quality of life and comfort, not because of some noble endeavor, but because they realize how advantageous they are, 
and eventually, even if sometimes there is some delay, eventually grab with both the hands these opportunities. Around the time L.V. Prasad Institute was founded in 1987, if you recall, to get a telephone in this country, and I don't know how hard Dr. Rao had tried to get his own personal telephone after moving from the U.S. to India, or for the institution, it was a Herculean task. I remember I had to pay 8,000 rupees about a few years after that, after the founding of this institution in Hyderabad, waited two, three years to get a telephone. And then of course, all the travails of telephones we know. Today, we have a billion telephones in the country, as opposed to about 7 million telephones in 1987. 7 million to 1,000 million in just one generation. At possibly the lowest cost, with a quality comparable to the best in the world. Not because of our greatness, but the march of technology, science and technology, perhaps is the greatest driver of change, more than even political institutions or organizational ability. We live in that exciting age. So much is possible. Look at the way in the last two years, we've seen the best and worst of what is happening today. COVID was a monumental challenge, the challenge of a century. While many perished, the remarkable fight back by humanity at large that within one year, we could actually develop as humanity the vaccines, effective, safe vaccines. We could manufacture on a mega scale. By now, probably more than 7 billion doses were distributed across the world, administered across the world. In the next year and four months, by the end of 2022, I can reasonably say that we will reach about 15 to 18 billion doses administered, whether full vaccination or booster doses across the world, of which India will be a significant player because now we're ramping up production. We probably will supply about one third of all the vaccines, if not more, of COVID in the next year and four months. It's a miracle. It never happened any time before. We have such immense possibilities today that there are 100,000 viruses, um, hundreds of thousands of viruses, which could become pandemics anytime because of the devastation brought about by human activity in an anthropomorphic world is of course a cause of deep disquiet. We see both light and darkness. We see the causes of the cause of celebration and the cause of consternation. Both coexist today as never before. But I believe on balance, we today have available technology, resources, and opportunity to transform our world and our lives as never before. What many people dreamt, like Victor Hugo, more than a century ago, about 125 years ago, he dreamt of 20th century. Most of those dreams were not fulfilled, but in the 21st century, Hugo's dream a century ago actually can be a reality. One is knowledge and skills, then compassion, then the organizational ability and managerial skill to actually translate the possibilities into reality. These can be done by any one of us. L.V. Prasad Institute has shown what is possible. But many, many things need to be done collectively as nation states or as humanity at large. And that's where political will and therefore alignment of political incentives with public good is critical. And finally, even if the alignment exists, there are some areas where institutional and structural changes are required. For instance, healthcare, the transformation in India is possible because there is vote in that. Without being party political, there is an alignment of political interest, political incentive with public good. 
if not today, I'm absolutely certain in the next five, 10 years, hopefully the sooner, not than the later, we will transform our health sector significantly. It will not be world's number one, but it will be pretty good. We will not have 38,000 lives lost or 38,000 years lost for 100,000 people every year. We'll be able to reduce that by about 20,000 or so, which is a remarkable accomplishment. It's inexorable. But there are some areas which require more than political alignment, more than political incentive. They require institutional and structural transformation, rule of law, looking at the structure of power, accountability systems, and a lot more. That may be a little harder, but I believe that can happen too. As I said, we are on the cusp of history. Take the energy sector. On the positive side, the dramatic breakthroughs in solar power, other renewable forms of energy, including cellulosic enzymes, creating biofuels on a mega scale, and the storage technology in power sector. These are the most exciting changes in human history. We are in a generation's time going to enter an age of abundance of energy without damage to Mother Earth, which was the stuff of fiction a quarter century ago. But the negative side, the climate change is already upon us. We already seem to be about a generation late. I don't believe it's too late, but there are immense dangers. And the problems of transition as Europe is now witnessing, for instance, this winter could be an extremely harsh and painful winter for much of Europe, because there are challenges of transition. There's always a clash between the immediate need and the long-term good. Again, take the economic transformation going on in the world. You see, an abundance of goods and services as never before, Human wants are being met better than ever before. Take India. If you take the food sector, your executive chairman, Dr. Prashant Gurg, comes from an agricultural scientist family. He and I were discussing briefly. In 1950, we only produced 52 million tons of food grains. We were starving. People used to call it a ship-to-mouth system. 52 million tons. Today, India is sitting on mountains of food grains not knowing what to do with food. The peak time, we store in garment granaries alone 80 million tons of food grains. Storage, I'm talking about. Not knowing what to do with that. Abundance. And fewer and fewer people are producing more and more. This is the uniqueness of modernity. In almost all spheres of activity, except the, at the level of lowest possible skills, fewer and fewer people are producing more and more. Therefore, on the positive side, we have the abundance. On the negative side, we have a challenge. What do you do with the leisure time? And what do you do? to give dignity and productivity to the bulk of humanity, to give them a sense of purpose. People like Mahatma Gandhi always worried about giving dignity. All economists worry about full employment, not only as an economic necessity, but as a most important factor in stabilizing society, in ennobling human life. 30 years later, if a small number of people can produce the vast requirements of all mankind or humankind, what do the rest of the people do? I don't know if you reflected even today, all the abundant manufacturing that's going on in the world, everything you see is a product of modern manufacturing. Out of a total global population of 7.8 billion, 
just about 180 million people, just about 180 million people, a little under 2.5 percent, about 2.2, 2.3 percent of the human population is actually manufacturing anything. They are meeting most of our material needs in the world today. So we have both the pluses and minuses. Population, when I was a kid, or in medical school, Dr. Rao and I went to the same medical school. Many of us were terrified about the population explosion. We had nightmares. I wrote an essay in those days arguing for compulsory sterilization as an impetuous, angry, passionate, but not particularly wise young man. I was so terribly worried. But today, all over the world, including in Africa, we see that the population is going to now stabilize. You take India, all the southern states, Telangana, Andhra Pradesh, Karnataka, Tamil Nadu, Kerala, or many other states, Maharashtra, Delhi, Punjab, Gujarat, Odisha, regarded as one of the poorest states, but has a remarkable job. And many, many other states have now reached a level well below population stabilization, a fertility rate of less than 2.1. India's population will probably reach about 1.6 billion, we are now at 1.4 billion and it will stabilize and then slowly start falling. Global population will probably reach about 9.6 billion, stabilize and slowly starts falling. So the population problem as we understood about 25, 30, 50, 40 years ago is a thing of the past. There's a dramatic change that is happening. And many of us still are obsessed with the problems of the past, ignoring both our potential and the crises of the future. But even as population seems to be stabilizing, national boundaries are becoming rigid. You don't know what to do with the nation state system. There are shortages of workers in many countries because of demographic transition. Take Japan, for instance. For 30 years, there's been economic stagnation. There simply are not enough people to work or enough consumers to buy goods. And there are far too many countries where there are too many people not knowing what to do. As a globe, the answer is very self-evident. But as societies in nation states, there are impenetrable barriers. That's the downside. Globalization, most of us recognize, you know, even a casual glance at Elie Prasad's history shows how much we all share and respect and learn from each other, benefit from each other. Without globalization, there's no modern medicine. Without globalization, there's no modern manufacturing. There's no modern trade. There's no science and technology. And there are no universal notions of humanity and human rights without globalization. But at the same time, we are also seeing increasing tribalism increasing polarization driven largely by technology, the social media, and increasing nihilism and terrorism. Both are going apace, side by side. Go back to Dickens again. We live in the best of times. We live in the worst of times. But I believe it is not necessary that our future will be as complicated as our present appears to be. I believe we have immense capacity as human beings to make lives better. We often overestimate our capacity to transform things in the short term and underestimate our ability to bring about significant change in the long term. I'm sure even Dr. Rao with his vision in 1987 could not have imagined that in a quarter century or in three decades, he would have been able to generate a process and build an institutional mechanism which accomplishes so much. 
Of course, a lot more needs to be done. But remember how far we have come. Our anxiety to be able to produce remarkable results for the quarterly balance sheets is a very dangerous thing. It's necessary that we have to take care of the immediate, no question about it. But it's far more important to look at the long-term trajectory and certain motion processes and institutions to look at the future. Sometimes they're going to be hard knocks in the short term. Human history is full of those examples. Sometimes we don't embrace change easily. I was thinking of Einstein for some reason today. Much of Einstein's pioneering work was done in 1905, photoelectric effect and a whole lot of other things. A general theory of relativity that came also in the same year, well, a special theory of relativity. A general theory was developed over the next few years, 1907, to 1915, but by about 1910, 1911, it was already there. He got a Nobel in 1921. You know what? The Nobel Committee did not dare to say that they were awarding Nobel to Einstein for his greatest accomplishment, perhaps the greatest human accomplishment in all history, the general theory of relativity, because they were scared. My God, this is too outrageous. It's too far reaching. It's too radical. Therefore, they mentioned photoelectric effect. They said his general contributions to theoretical physics, in particular, photoelectric effect. Until 1919, on the 29th of May, when there was a full solar eclipse, when a group of scientists led by Sir Arthur Eddington, they went to South America and observed the actual bending of light rays as Einstein's theory predicted around the sun. Until that time, nobody seriously believed theory of relativity. In the frontier areas of theoretical physics and technology, it's inevitable that there's going to be a time of transition. But even in the more practical realm, sometimes there is a delay. Let me give you before concluding the story of Ignace Semmelweis from our own branch, our own field of human endeavor, the medical science. Semmelweis was born in 1919. He was born in Hungary. He grew up to be a physician in those days, in 19th century, mid 19th century. Went to Vienna, the capital of Austro-Hungarian Empire, the seat of not only empire, but also culture and modernity and science in Europe at the time, Vienna. In his practice, he discovered that about 15% of women, 15% of women were dying in childbirth. Imagine 15 out of 100 women, 15 to 20 women dying in childbirth, either during childbirth or after childbirth with what we now are in those days called puerperal fever. They did not know why. Remember, by 1950, 1850s, mankind did not discover bacteria. We did not understand the causation of disease yet. Samuel Wies also did not know why. But by a series of experiments through empirical evidence, he discovered that if only the physician attending at the woman in labor washed the hands properly, what we now call sterilization and sanitation and so on and so forth, washed the hands properly, and after turning on one patient before going to the next one, again, wash the hands properly. For some unknown, mysterious reason, this mortality was coming down to 1 or 2%, from 15% to 1 or 2%. When Pfizer's vaccine or Moderna vaccine is seen to be 90% plus effective, we said, my, what a miracle. It was 95% effective, just washing hands. The cause was not known because, as I said, they did not discover bacteria. The germ theory was not known yet. Semmelweis, please remember that at the height of enlightenment, actually quite by 
a coincidence that was the period when Charles Dickens wrote his novel, 1850s, A Tale of Two Cities. In Age of Enlightenment, by 1840, the Industrial Revolution, as we understand in history, the first phase was over in Britain, 1760 to 1840. So we're not talking of an ordinary age. We're talking of a scientific age, an age of tremendous confidence, tremendous optimism, tremendous sense of science and technology, a sense of rational thought, reasoned discussion. So he pleaded with the fellow doctors, not European citizens, not ordinary people, the educated fellow physicians. He said, please wash your hands. This is the evidence. I don't know why. If only you wash your hands before attending an, a woman in labor, you will save so many lives. Not one doctor said, let me try. Not ordinary people, doctors. Not only did they ignore him, but they laughed him off. They humiliated him. They branded him as insane. He was institutionalized, put away in a mental asylum in Vienna. In those days, in a mental asylum, the treatment typically is brutal physical abuse. He was tortured in the asylum. Ultimately, he died in 1865 of the gangrene resulting from those injuries in the mental asylum. But here is the lovely part. A wonderful human being lost his life, but then, you know, that's part of history, but here is the lovely part. Within 20 years, three great men influenced by SMLVs, Robert Koch, all medical doctors, physicians know Koch's contribution to medical science, whether Koch's postulates or tubercle bacilli, Louis Pasteur, the author of the germ theory, and one of the first vaccines developed. Even today, Pasteur Institute and the organizations is started a very important globally even today. And Joseph Lister, the man who became famous for sanitation and sterilization and asepsis. They were all contemporaries, influenced by Samuel Vijay's work. Within 20 years, they radically transformed medical science and human life. Human society has immense capacity to absorb what is right, what is useful, even if sometimes in the short term we falter, even if sometimes in the short term we make tragedies happen, even if some people pay the price, the ultimate price with their lives like Semmelweis. But in the medium and long term, we have the capacity to realize how much it makes a difference. The early resistance, the inertia that Dr. Gerg talked about is broken. People embrace something new, sometimes with great alacrity, a little more excessively than it should be like social media today. But on balance, we have the capacity. I think great visionaries and leaders like Dr. J. N. Rao, they show us how much is possible. They give us hope they give us confidence. And a leader is only as good as his team. No matter how great a leader you are, without a team of followers who are embracing the ideas, participating in the process of change, and delivering high quality services to transform human life, an individual, however great that person is, from Jesus Christ to Lord Gautama Buddha to Mahatma Gandhi to any number of prophets, no matter how great a leader is, at the end of the day, it is the followers, it is the teams, it is their dedication, their sustenance, their constant improvement, their innovation, their commitment, their compassion. You in the Louis Prasad Institutions Group, all of your teams over the past 35 years have shown that exemplary courage and leadership and you followed a path, a trailblazing path, you showed us what is possible. A lot more is necessary. A lot more is possible. I hope that for our country, 
and at a larger level, I hope for all mankind, because now increasingly the 21st century, to think of ourselves only as a country and nothing more than that is not particularly useful. Not only is it a matter of idealism, it's also a matter of pragmatism, because now we realize, and if some people are not cognizant of that, I'm sure after COVID they would realize problems anywhere are a curse to people everywhere. We cannot isolate ourselves, even if we wish to. We live together, we swim together, we sink together. I'm certain, as a possibilist, and therefore as a cautious optimist, that in the next 30 years, the world will be transformed, India will be transformed, our healthcare and eye care will be transformed, and the work you have done in the past three decades and more will be the most important foundation for this transformation in the field of healthcare and eye care. I salute you for your work. I congratulate you on this wonderful day. I thank you for the honor of inviting me to share a few reflections on contemporary challenges. I wish you all the very best. Thank you. <laughs>